Thank you very much for the introduction, Professor Lee. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, strain hardening control in, uh, in automotive uh, steels today. Um, but before I start, I'd like to say a few things about uh, what is the emphasis of the research in my group. Um, and I, I like to use this, um, this uh, schematic. So uh, I, uh, in terms of research, you basically have um, on one end a uh, basic scientific research and a whole spectrum of uh, possibilities. And at the other end, you have um, technological innovation. And I believe that um, research uh, that has really uh, potential to have a high impact is, um, is at either end of this spectrum. And uh, in MDL, um, that's where we are. We are on the uh, end of technical innovation. So very much of my research is inspired by what goes on in the industry, in the steel industry specifically, in relation to automotive materials. And so that's the context of um, uh, the presentation I'm giving uh, this afternoon. So um, many of you must certainly have heard the word or the words uh, high manganese steels. Uh, Mr. Uh, this, I don't know if it's going to be bothering, but this, uh, my slide doesn't quite show. Um, maybe um, interesting to see um, the slide heading as we go. Um, you may have heard about uh, high manganese steels. And about a year ago, I started making a list of uh, everything that was being published in this area, in particular, the compositions of steels. And uh, I stopped doing this because I had uh, already more than uh, one or two slides with these compositions. And one of the things that strikes you is the, uh, the manganese contents, first of all. And you have levels going from, uh, on this slide, 34% in mass to 5. That's a wide, very wide range. And that is very strange to say the least. Um, the other thing is that the same steels um, have also very high contents of other alloying elements. So if you uh, put the manganese content on the x-axis and you plot carbon, aluminum, silicon, nitrogen on the y-axis, you also see very large concentrations of these alloying elements. For instance, here I just want to point out a 12% aluminum uh, content. So what is going on uh, is the question uh, I am asking myself. Uh, because I am a person who is interested in automotive steels. Now, 99,5% of the cars, of the many millions of cars we produce today, are made with steel. Uh, the body materials of these steels, of these, of these cars, are made with steels with the composition that's, oops, on this diagram, on this diagram, in this corner. So if you want to put the composition of the most formable steels on this diagram, the most formable steels are the IF grades. They have about 20 ppm of carbon and about a tenth of or two tenths of a percent of manganese. So they'd be right here in the corner. That would be the softest steels. The hardest steels we use today in cars would be, uh, say, hot press forming steels. They're martensitic grades, so you very difficult to get anything harder at this time. They have 0.2% of carbon and a 1.5% of manganese. So what's going on? Why is everybody out here with compositions that are very much higher than uh, uh, what the automotive is currently using? What is happening? Uh, do we know? what we're doing in uh, automotive steels research. So, and it's really important to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I love this uh, passage in Alice in Wonderland, who spends a lot of time asking difficult questions in that book. 
one of the questions she likes to ask is, which road do I take? She's always looking for the exit, right? Cat, cats speak in uh, that book. Where do you want to go? Asks the cat. And she says, I don't know. And then the cat gives this absolutely wonderful answer, then it doesn't matter. So if you don't know where you want to go, it really doesn't matter where you get there. Right? So if you see this explosion of compositions and activity in metals in, in steel research that I just showed you, uh, you may wonder, you know, do we know where we're going? You know? Well, um, actually it took me some time uh, to prepare this presentation. And uh, I, uh, as, as we'll go, I, I'd like to say thank you now, rather than at the end. I'd like to thank some people uh, who may or may not be in the audience, uh, the students should be, um, who uh, have actually uh, given me lots of ideas and uh, allowed me to, to put things in perspective. Uh, Professor Nachtung Kim and some of his colleagues at MSNE department uh, really uh, pointed to uh, the use of aluminum as a very extremely important uh, element in terms of the phys physical metallurgy it uh, creates uh, in these steels. Uh, Professor dong um his work at KIMS, uh, his co-workers at KIMS, and, and his uh, the, uh, work, uh, uh, early work certainly at GFT, uh, really uh, I, I think personally show that it is very important to have delta ferrite in these microstructures of uh, steels. And then I also have very uh, clever uh, graduate students, Siong Li and Sang Li, who have come up with uh, very uh, interesting ideas in the course of their uh, PhD work, and I'll, I'll share some of their results with you as we. Okay, so today um, I'll try to tell you or explain to you that what we're all trying to do with these high manganese steels is control the strain hardening of these steels. And I'll try to explain why it's so important, why it's so simple, why it's so important, and why at the same time it's kind of a difficult thing to do. But um, please, automotive sheet products uh, have to satisfy many, many requirements other than strength or strain hardening, right? Because they have to, you have to go through a process of pressing the panels, welding them, painting them, and things as mundane as visual appearance are extremely important. And then you crash test the whole thing to make sure that the passengers are safe. So if, uh, let's just look at uh, how cars are made today, particular bodies of cars. Uh, this is the uh, GM Avio. It's a car that's made in South Korea today. This is the kinds of steels we, we, we use. IF steels, high strength steel, dual phase steels, and even Martin City grades. Now, we are, as uh, people in steel research, steel science, very much under pressure, certainly the people in automotive uh, steels, because there are lots of alternative materials that compete for this application. Hmm? And so we have aluminum alloys, magnesium alloys, polymers, all kinds of composites, and even carbon fiber reinforced composites who may actually uh, be used for structural parts in, uh, of cars. And perhaps one day, if we can manage to make uh, cheaper cost-effective titanium alloys, we may be uh, seeing more titanium in the, uh, in the bodies. In addition to uh, materials competition, there are regular, you can't read this here, sadly enough, but there are a lot of regulatory pressures on which, which will steer uh, material selection in the industry. In particular, we have uh, since last year, if for instance in the US, we have very stringent targets for mileage and emissions regulations. And they're extremely hard. We are talking about doubling the average miles per gas for new cars and reducing the, um, the gas emissions by half. That's point number one. And in terms of passenger safety, you know that many cars today can easily get through the five stars rating. There will be tougher collision and rollover safety standards. So 
This means that in a car body, parts like cross members, A pillars, B pillars, door reinforcements, we will all see move the me me mechanical requirements for these parts to the ultra high strength level. That means these parts will have to have gigapascal tensile strengths at least. Right? Uh, some numbers here. Uh, first of all, the cars we are driving are getting steadily heavier, so part of the uh, control of uh, the light weighting through use of high strength steels is, is not weight reduction, but is containment of the increase in weight. And um, so kind of slowing down this, the weight sp spiral of uh, vehicles. And then the other thing is the gas mileage and the uh, requirements, uh, regulatory uh, requirements for fuel efficiency. And uh, what it means in practice is that we have today the technology to achieve this kind of uh, mileage I was talking about, uh, which would in the US would correspond to 50 miles per day. That's the Prius Toyota. Toyota Prius does this. It means that in 2000, from 2022 onward, every single car will have to meet this kind of a gas mileage. This is going to be quite a, a, a challenge, a material challenge. So one of the first reactions uh, as, uh, one can have as, as material scientists is of course, make, let's make the material strength. Let's do this in a very cost effective fashion. So uh, the grain size, that's the, that's the thing uh, because we've all heard about uh, ultra-fine materials. We've all heard about nano uh, uh, grain sized material and, and the marvelous uh, strengths you get uh, when you do this. Mm? And so let's, let's have a look at this first. So to start off, it, the steel industry is, is uh, not, um, uh, knows, knows very well how to control grain sizes. Uh, we have also a very wide spectrum of grain sizes in steel products. For instance, in grain-oriented electrical steels, you easily have grains that are uh, centimeters large. And um, by thermal mechanical processing, we can achieve today, maybe not on a routine basis, but it can be achieved on, in, in standard practice, uh, five mic micron uh, grain sizes. So, and that would be the technical limit in terms of grain size for carbon steels. However, uh, we can make bionitic steels, martensitic steels, and there the, grain, the unit size of the ferrite is, is easily a sub-micron level. So we have ultra-fine microstructures already in use in our materials. So, uh, so we'd be interested in, uh, you know, can we get lower? Yeah? Uh, and it's possible by severe plastic deformation. So let's do a process that seems to be compatible with the industry and do some severe plastic deformation by relative roll bonding. Hmm? And so what is this technology? It's a rolling technology, so it's very compatible with a uh, standard production, more or less. What you do is you start with a microstructure, all right? Uh, in this case, it's a, a, it's a, a IF steel. Okay, you pass it through your, your rolling uh, stand. You get unrecrystallized ferrite grains because you do this at room temperature. You clean the surface, remove the oxides. You cut this into, you stack the two halves. You reheat it to soften a little bit the material by recovery. And, and you, you repeat this. And you repeat this thing 10 times. And when you do this, you can achieve very, very large amounts of, of strain uh, without shape change, basically. Hmm? And, so, and what happens is as you uh, process this material, uh, at the beginning you pancake these grains, you get a very uh, lamellar structure, and the structure becomes more and more textured. So you get very strong, in this case, for fiber texture. And then something happens as you cross into close to 99.9% of deformation. You get this uh, very interesting microstructure where uh, the random, or the, excuse me, the, uh, the non-random orientation disappears. So basically, now the grains have high angle boundaries between them and um, 
And this coincides with these very high strength properties. And what you also see, what also with this particular technique happens is uh, there comes a point where you stop uh, refining the microstructure. So let's look at the properties you get. Um, and uh, well, as you expected, you all know the whole patch equation. The yield strength will increase proportionally to the uh, one over the square root of your grain diameter. But what you also see, that's the yield strength, is that the tensile strength also has a whole patch uh, relation with a slower, lower slope. So in other words, these two cross. Yes? And when the yield strength becomes equal to the tensile strength, this means something very simple, is that necessarily the uniform elongation collapses and becomes essentially zero, and it happens slightly below a grain size of one micron. And uh, you, your material doesn't brittle, uh, break in a brittle fraction. There is still some total elongation. But the deformation is purely diffuse, yes? And that makes the material basically totally incompatible with press forming, yes? Because the first thing a press forming person looks at is what is the FLD diagram of this material? And you may not be familiar with an FLD diagram, and I, I, I will not go into details too much, but basically when you uh, 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 press form a two-dimensional sheet, you get strains in the plane of the sheet, you get minor strains, and you get major strains, all right? And you, you, can, you will accept from me that the more you strain the material, yes, the more it deforms, and there will be a point, yes, where the amount of strain you, you put into the, the sheet, you'll get fracture, okay? Well, that's called the forming limit curve, yes? And if you apply a deformation and you kind of stay, you, you never pass this curve, you can deform the material. That's basically the simple idea. What happens, well, it turns out that this point here, yes, is equal to the uniform elongation, approximately, yes? And we'll see in a moment, or you probably already know if you've taken uh, introductory metallurgical uh, mechanics, that this is the same as the strain hardening. So if the strain hardening or the uniform elongation is zero, you basically have a material that's very bad in forming. What you actually want is a material that does the reverse, that has, gives you increased strain hardening, an increased N value. Yeah. So, uh, so if you want, for instance, to make this uh, uh, very complex shape here, a, a shock absorber housing with your new high strength steel, um, you want to have, uh, and, and you want a material that's better than, for instance, this strip steel here, yes? You want to go, you want to have a material that increases the, this minimum value, for instance, a twip steel, yes? That will make a substantial difference. You don't want to move in this direction, however strong the material is. Hmm? Okay, so um, mater uh, materials mechanics 101. Uh, the stress strain curve of a material can be written as a power, Holloman power law, yes? And uh, uh, you know that if you make the derivative of this, you can show that this exponent here, yes, is, should be equal to the uniform elongation. And if you uh, work this out for uh, low carbon steel, you see that this is more or less okay. Yes, not perfectly, and the reason uh, why it's not perfectly okay is because this Holloman equation is of course not a physical equation, it's an empirical equation. Hmm? And uh, this n value here is actually not, thing, it's not constant. And uh, if you want to know the, uh, the relation between uh, stress and strain, yes, you have to use this equation, which is an equation which relates, uh, there are two versions of the same equation, we'll use, we'll use the tensile stress uh, sh uh, strain equation. Uh, 
you find, you, we, we know that this, uh, this, the, the, the tensile, uh, the equation of the tensile curve is given by this. It depends on the square root of the dislocation density. Now, uh, uh, sigma zero is, is a constant, alpha prime is a constant, g is the shear modulus, b is the Burgers factor of the material. So it basically means that if you want to control the strain hardening, you will have to be able to control the dislocation density. And that is quite a challenge. So first of all, does this equation hold? Yes, it holds. So for instance, here, for a number of uh, steels, you have here this uh, relation between the stress and the density of dislocations. This is the square root of dislocation. You see a more or less linear uh, relation for a lot of uh, different types of steels. And this is the same here for single crystal data. And this is, uh, and, and they don't uh, overlap because this is the shear stress uh, versus dislocation density relation. So basically, you're in business. If you know how to determine uh, the change in dislocation density with strain, yes, you can basically calculate uh, a material, what your material should look like to have the properties you want. Hmm? Uh, for instance, um, so there, is, there are theories like this. Uh, and uh, so if you're interested in names, so the, the, uh, the Cox, the Mac and Cox models, and yes, um, which uh, use the, uh, the dislocation density as the parameter that controls the strain hardening. So you can, uh, if you if you know how this changes, you can basically calculate the stress strain curve of ferrite, stress strain curve of martensite. These are calculated curves, by the way, um, th and their very specific uh, strain hardening behavior. Yeah. Right. So. But physically, you know, how, how, what happens in the background? Well, and, and um, why is it that we need new types of new alloy designs today? Yes. Um, what is it that prevents us from improving the dislocation density or controlling the dislocation density and by that, uh, and in that way, control the strain hardening? Well, first, I must say, I must give you a few background things or remind you of some uh, background things. So, oops, sorry. The dislocation density in general, so the way you have to imagine things in a uh, deforming piece of steel is you have dislocation sources. From these dislocation sources, dislocations uh, propagate until they hit obstacles. And there they are immobilized. So there are two families of dislocations. You have mobile dislocations and immobile dislocations stuck at obstacles. It turns out that the density of mobile dislocations is more or less constant. Yes, And uh, the increase in the dislocation is an increase in immobile dislocation. So here is you have some data for steel. Yes, As you strain the material, the population of mobile dislocations it remains small and uh, constant, more or less, of immobile dislocation increases. You will notice that I didn't use M or I as subscripts to uh, these dislocation densities. And I did this specifically because the C refers to cell and W refers to wall. What cells and what walls are we talking about? Well, dislocations in steels actually very quickly into the deformation, very early stage in the deformation, form 3D structures, very regular 3D structures that we call um, cells. And that happens at very low strains already, 4%, 4%. 5% of strain, you can already see the dislocations forming these aggregates. And then at 10%, you have these very, like in this case, square pattern of dislocations. You have very high dislocation cell walls and very low dislocation cell interiors. The deformation is entirely due to the 
uh, uh, transfer of dislocations from one cell wall to the other cell wall and their trapping in the cell wall. Yes? All right. Good. Let's look now. Oh, yeah, and I wanted, before I uh, go, I wanted to tell you that this, the cell size is about a few hundreds of nanometers in size. Exactly the size you have after severe plastic deformation, such as accumulative roll bonding. So, um, so what happens when you, uh, when, let's just look at the motion of dislocations here and BCC, why, trying to understand why is it that we're stuck that with uh, certain mechanical properties that will not allow us to have very high strain hardening in BCC steels, in ferritic steels. Well, okay, so when you deform a metal, let's say it's a single crystal here, and you, you, uh, you pull it, you have, uh, for instance, a screw dislocation here that moves uh, by jumping from one Pyrrhus uh, valley to another Pyrrhus valley. What is very important about these dislocations in BCC is they have gigantic stacking fault energies. So these stacking fault energies are so high that we have to use DFT to, um, uh, to know what they are. This, and, and, and DFT can help us uh, because you can uh, you, get, you even get a generalized stacking fault energy. So for instance, if you do a shift from, uh, as, such as the one I, I'm showing here uh, in uh, the picture here, and you, you can track the change in energy, and the top here is what, what we would call the stacking fault energy. The value is thousands of millijoules per square meter, yes? And I want to point out that 100 millijoules per square meter, that's a high stacking fault energy. So aluminum, nickel have stacking fault energies of slightly higher than this. So in other words, dislocations in BCC iron are absolutely not dissociated, yes? So they can very easily cross slip. They can very easily form these kinks on different slip planes on different 110 slip planes. Yeah? And they do this very readily. And so if you, for instance, if you form a kink on one slip plane and a kink on another slip plane, when they meet, they form a jog. Yes? Now in BCC, that has very important consequences because you, can, you don't need to have dislocation intersections to have jog formations, that's one. And second, these jogs can act as very efficient um, sources of dislocations. This, as Reed, you, you're, you're familiar with uh, Frank Reed sources. Well, these jogs can act as very efficient uh, uh, sources of dislocation, and they, you only need one pole for this one. The other thing they do, <coughs> uh, and I want to, to show you this, to, to actually prove to you that, that this is very prevalent, this uh, cross slip. The dislocation, so one, of, one end of the dislocations can uh, jog up a few planes, and then the other uh, end of the dislocation can do the same thing, but a little bit, with a little bit of delay, so uh, uh, a little bit later. And uh, in this case, for instance, they, the, the two parts can then meet up again, and they leave behind dislocation loops. Yes? So seeing these loops would actually be a, a proof that you have a lot of, excuse me, um, uh, cross slip uh, in these BCC. And this is indeed, you can see here, this is a BCC uh, iron, uh, steel, and you can see uh, all over the place, you see these little dislocation loops everywhere, and this is called debris. And this is basically nothing else than these dislocation loops that are left behind by frequent cross slips of the dislocations. Means, what does this mean? This means that dislocation in BCC iron, they can, they run into a little problem, a little obstacle, they can bypass the obstacle without much difficulty, yes? Right? And as a consequence, yeah, they show very little hardening because obstacles don't really work in holding up the dislocation. Hmm? So um, ferritic steels, low stacking fault energy, lots of cross slip, very little strain hardening, yes? Um, austenitic stainless uh, steels, most of them are here, uh, it's one austenitics, and you have some twip steels here. The cross slip is much more, uh, much smaller, 
because uh, the stacking fault energy is much lower. So you get very limited cross-slip and you get a much larger strain hardening. Now, some of you may wonder, uh, yes, but I remember from you know, these, oops, uh, the, uh, my lectures, you know, when you look at uh, single crystals of, of uh, materials that, you know, you have this thing called uh, easy slip and, and, you know, how does this connect with what we're looking at here? Well, so uh, what, stage two, stage three, what does this, how does this connect with my polycrystal uh, hardening? Hmm? So let's have a look. Uh, at, this is data now for single crystals, yes? single crystals of austenitic steels and single crystals of ferritic steels. You see the same thing. Yeah? Very high rate of uh, hardening in the case of the uh, austenitics, very low in the case of the ferritics, all due to cross-slip. But let's have a look now at the details of this uh, hardening. The, you see here in particular for the one uh, 011, you see a a flat plateau here, that's the easy slip, very few dislocations. An increase in the strain hardening, yes, yes, that's called stage two, and then a decrease in the strain hardening, that's annihilation, yes. Well, it turns out that when you uh, deform a steel, you're always, most of the time, you're in stage three, yes, you're in stage three, you're in this stage of cell forming. Yeah? If you compare the strain hardening as a function of stress and you look at the single crystal, so easy, easy glide you had very uh, low strain hardening and then you have a very high strain hardening in stage two. Yes? That is actually the only time that you get strain hardening. Yes? In stage three, we call it parabolic hardening but actually this, the work hardening goes down as you, as you stress the material. So it goes down. The polycrystalline hardening is essentially stage three. And it's not a hardening, it's a softening. Okay? Right, so let's go back to our calculations. Yes? Um, what can we do? Okay, well, let's look at uh, my relation of dislocation density uh, as a change as a function of strain. Yes? Um, and uh, it turns out that this first term here is related to dislocation accumulation. That's my stage two factor. Yeah. And this is the second term, is the, the, the annihilation or the trapping of my dislocations, yeah? dynamic recovery. That's stage three. Yes. And you can see this one is negative, so uh, if this increases, I will have a negative a decrease in, um, uh, in the strain hardening. So what happens if I manage the situation such that I have a reduction in the dislocation annihilation rate, for instance, with strain or with increasing stress, I can have this happening to my blue curve and this happening to the strain hardening. In other words, I gain strength and ductility, yes? Which is something that doesn't happen when you uh, go into very tiny grain sizes in a single phased material, yes? It just doesn't work because you cannot increase, basically uh, increase this. Yeah? So how do we do this? How, how do you do this? Yes. Okay. So I want, uh, again want to want to show you that uh, you know, what doesn't work have a single phase ferritic material. This is an IF steel. You can see that as long as you uh, e uh, decrease the grain size uh, and, and you don't pass the, the critical one micron level, yes, um, the material improves in strength and, and the ductility is pretty much uh, kept. But as soon as you're below the uh, the micron, you can see. Everything, all the deformation you get is post-uniform elongation, and the material basically has no strain hardening. And, and so, in, in fine grained material, single phase ultra fine grained material, we have a large uh, increase in the dislocation annihilation rate, and the conventional dislocation multiplication mechanisms are very much reduced in small grains. So, dislocation accumulation in the normal way cannot be controlled. However, 
Yes? In the past uh, few years, we have developed steels for automotive applications which actually work on increasing the strain hardening. Hmm? And uh, this is the strain hardening of a high strength IF steel, and excuse me, the, the stress strain curve and the strain hardening curve. Yeah. And you can see that the strip steel and this strip steel and this twip steels manage to get an increase in strength together with an increase in uh, uh, ductility, yes, without any problems, yes. So how is this done? Yes, how is this done? This case, um, first of all, in the case of twip steels, we have resolutely gone from ferritic systems, ferritic alloys to austenitic alloys, and, and we've basically we're in a system with a very uh, much much larger much much lower, excuse me, stacking fault energy. What is interesting is that the trip steels, which may not uh, give such a huge improvement, are also pretty good because, pretty interesting, because they achieve these strength levels and these ductility increases at relatively uh, low alloying contents, yes? And this is a route that is gaining popularity. And this is one of the reasons why we are seeing this vast uh, and very diffuse clouds of composition where people are trying to see which one is the solution. So let's, um, so, so, so we'll go through these systems, yes, and I will uh, talk a little bit more of the last two, the last system where you have multi-phase materials. Uh, and so for, first let's talk about the ones where uh, 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 people and researchers have gone to fully austenitic structures with, um, and uh, the first one is the uh, shear band induced plasticity. It works on a very special uh, mechanism. The mechanism is that um, it's an austenitic steel but with a very high stacking fault energy. I said very high, <coughs> not low. Hmm? Um, so you'd think that's not a good idea. The reason why it, you get a very pronounced planar slip in this case uh, is because you have small uh, kappa carbide precipitates in there which are coherent with the matrix, yes? And so when a dislocation moves through a, uh, these, a, a plane of kappa carbides, precipitates, and they're everywhere in this microstructure, they will cut a number of kappa carbide particles. And this uh, process, it will facilitate the glide of other dislocations on exactly the same glide plane, yes? And you get shear deformation, very pronounced shear deformation, although the stacking fault energy is very high. These materials were originally, uh, uh, many uh, uh, ways in which people have arrived at this design concept were originally designed because they have very high aluminum contents, making them lightweight, you know, low density steels, which, which, which is very interesting. But by this, by doing this, you know, the people in this area pointed out for the first time that there's a lot to be done with the aluminum, not only in terms of uh, the uh, density change, but also in terms of the uh, physical matter the mechanical properties. The next system, um, which has a slightly lower uh, manganese content, uh, can be as low as 15, is a twinning induced plasticity steel. Here we have a low stacking fault energy, yes? Uh, so with very limited cross slip. And it has an additional advantage, is it makes use of the dynamic hole patch effect through twinning twin, uh, deformation twin formation. So as you deform the material, yes, the, uh, you get planar glide, first of all, so not much cross slip. So this location pile up against each other, yes, and in order to continue having the move, yes, or continuing creating new dislocations, you have to increase the stress, yes. And th so that's one thing that happens, and you form these deformation-induced twin. So as you deform, you get more deformation 
twins, and you basically reduce the, uh, effectively the uh, grain size in a dynamical way. Yeah? In this case, you, this is a stacking fault energy controlled solution, and you need about 20 millijoules per square meters to, uh, to have this work. But it's an austenitic steel, it's a single phase steel. Let's now look at the realm of the multi-phase solutions, yes? And those ones uh, are uh, usually trip solution, but I will end by showing that it is actually possible to have multi-phase solution with TWIP uh, uh, as a plasticity enhancing uh, mechanism, plasticity or strain hardening enhancing mechanism. So in a, in a trip steel, you basically have a steel and then disperse through it small particles of retained austenite, yes? And as you strain this, you get strain-induced transformation. Now this is a very interesting process. There are three things are happening when you have this deformation. So first of all, the austenite is transformed to martensite, high carbon martensite, so it becomes, th that volume becomes exceedingly strong, yes? That's point number one. Point number two, the volume expands considerably. So if there is a, any hint of uh, 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 local uh, constrictions, uh, necking, it immediately stops. And, th and thirdly, what is also very important, is by this volume change, you, the uh, transformation injects a lot of mobile dislocations into the microstructure. So you get a very nice strain hardening mechanism with relatively low amounts of a, uh, this uh, retained austenite. Yeah. So um, very nice properties. You, this are some examples here for the TWIP steels. You can get 1,000 megapascal. Elongations are very high. You can follow the process of uh, twinning in uh, microscopes. We can also look at the microscope uh, theoretically using constitutive equation and if this is the stress strain curve you just saw uh, if the nice thing about if you have a, a constitutive equation you can switch on and switch off the the twinning and you can see you know what would happen to my uh, to this uh, uh, stress strain curve if I could switch off the twinning well this would happen you wouldn't reach the thousand uh, megapascal anymore yeah and um, if on the other hand, you would, you would be able to have the full microstructure uh, twin. This is what you would have, have as, uh, as properties. So this is a picture of the shear band induced plasticity uh, system. Again, very nice mechanical properties, uh, very smooth, high strain rate hardening. This is, again, a single phase material, yes? Now, in terms of the uh, manganese steels with the trip effect, uh, they tend to be interesting, yes, because they have such a low alloy content in comparison to the two other properties, yes. And because they have a, a low alloy content, they are easier to process, to weld, to uh, cast, etc. So there is interest in these uh, systems, but they're more complex because they have an ultra fine microstructure. So we have an interesting material that, uh, that has a trip effect. So some of this microstructure, uh, some of these grain, about half of these grains are uh, austenite, yes? Um, but it's an ultra-fine microstructure. And I started my presentation by telling you ultra-fine microstructures are bad, right? And it turns out that indeed, if you don't doctor this type of uh, medium manganese trip steels, you do not get good properties. Like, have a look at uh, these properties here. So if you, uh, if you look very quickly, you say, well, I get 20% and I get uh, strengths above 1,000, so this looks very promising. The problem is you get very large localized deformation strains, yes? Press forming people don't like this. And when you don't have localization, you get 
high, stra high strain rates, but very low elongations. So this is kind of material that looks nice but behaves badly. Hmm? You get uh, high strain hardening but low elongations. And the reason why is because the, uh, the, the properties of your austenite are so dependent on the temperature at which you form it. Hmm? And um, so the, the, these steels is made, are made in a very simple way. You austenitize them, you, you, uh, you turn them into martensite, and then you do an internal annealing, yes? And when you do this, you can choose at what temperature you do this. And uh, if you look at the composition of the, mangan the, the mang uh, austenite, the manganese composition is temperature dependent, and so is the carbon composition. And you see it, can, it peaks here to a very high value of 0.5, yes? And uh, depending on the temperature, you get different compositions and different uh, types of stability. Uh, you can see by the lithometry, if you do the first uh, cooling, you get, of course, a martensite transformation. If you do reheat an intermediate uh, anneal and you cool back, that is here, and you cool down, there is no more martensite transformation. So you've stabilized the austenite. It's stabilized uh, for two reasons. First of all, this reverse transformation creates austenite by enucleation and growth. You get your very nice uh, small uh, austenite grains, yes, and uh, with very low uh, defect concentrations. And then these particles also, uh, you have a lot of carbon and manganese partitioning to these particles. And it hap this partitioning is very efficient because these particles are so small. So it doesn't matter whether you uh, heat this thing 24 hours or three minutes, the partitioning is almost the same. But the big problem is the control of the transformation, yeah, the control of the strain hardening. Um, when we anneal at low temperatures, we get these very large plateaus, Luders plateaus, and indeed, if you could see, the Luders bands move through the material, yes? And again, as I said, uh, press formers don't like this kind of material. On the other hand, if you anneal at very high temperature, you get nice stress-strain curves, homogeneous deformation on this infrared image, uh, but the transformation is too quick, yes? So you can see the difference. In the case of 640, there is no change in the uh, density of uh, retained austenite. In the case of high temperature, there is a transformation, but the austenite is not stable enough. Hmm? When we look in the TM at these microstructure, we see very much the same thing as what the ultra-fine grained people see in their microstructure. For instance, the ferrite grains are undergo grain boundary thickening. So that means they absorb all the dislocation. And you see the same process as in the cell formation. The interior of the ferrite grains is, has an extremely low, uh, uh, extremely low uh, dislocation density. And the austenite in the formation, of course, turns into martensite. In addition to this, we've seen a lot of very interesting uh, deformation patterns. For instance, when the austenite does not uh, transform to martensite, it still does plastically deform, and it does this by the, the dislocations that do the deformation are partial dislocations. So you, you, all these lines here are not twins, are not martensites, are not, they're just stacking faults, and uh, what you basically have are uh, the grain boundaries emitting uh, partials, um, and that's this a sure sign that it's very difficult to nucleate or to have uh, dislocation sources in these ultrafine uh, grained microstructures. So, um, so you have this, again, a wonderful material that doesn't do it. And, and, and there, uh, again, came this idea from um, Dr. So that if you add some aluminum to the uh, the, the compositions, you can change, excuse me, you can change the microstructure. And instead of having a microstructure, yes, uh, where the, uh, both the austenite, 
excuse me, the, uh, the ferrite and the austenite are ultra fine grain, you have in addition, yes, some larger grain, yes? And so what you have to do for this is adding aluminum. And so you see what happens to the phase diagram as I add aluminum, the alpha per gamma uh, range expands and then suddenly opens up here. And it opens up to the delta phase. Yes? It means that you have grains in your uh, microstructure that do not transform anymore. And so you can have this microstructure, large delta ferrite grains and then smaller microstructure. And this is very interesting. Um, recently, uh, uh, some uh, researchers at, in material science at POSTEC and um, uh, co-workers of uh, Professor Nak Jung Kim uh, uh, figured out another clever way to get the same type of microstructure by using this kappa carbide that uh, we, uh, I mentioned earlier and uh, creating the, kappa car the, the austenite from the redissolution of the kappa carbide. Interesting thing in this uh, approach is that you have uh, not that much uh, aluminum. You do need, uh, excuse me, uh, mang uh, manganese. You do need more aluminum. Yes, but it's a lean manganese alloy. A negative, slightly negative point is that you do need to form these kappa carbides, so you do need to have slightly higher carbon contents. The very nice thing about these manganese additions, yes, excuse me, um, aluminum additions, is uh, this is this is a red band here. It's a uh, it's a, it's a, for me it's a, a technological constraint. Yes, this is the temperature at which continuous galvanizing lines operate when they anneal uh, cold rolled material. We're interested in, in this temperature range because a steel producer who makes automotive uh, grades does not change that temperature all the time. Yes? You might think that's a stupid thing, but there are many reasons they don't do it. So your furnace works at 800, your alloy, your new steel has to, concept has to work, has to be annealed at that temperature. Hmm? Um, whether or not it's the optimal temperature. Yeah? And uh, the neat thing about these aluminum additions is that you raise the carbon content at this annealing temperature and you also raise slightly the manganese content. So you have a way with the control with the aluminum concentration to change the composition of your retained austenite and thereby change its stability. Yes. So uh, again, you, you can look at this uh, microstructure. Hmm? The austenite, uh, ultrafine austenite here changes into martensite as you deform it. The ferrite uh, just uh, does what it normally does. Uh, one of my students figured out that if you added some vanadium carbide, uh, you would have precipitation hardening and that would give you uh, an additional uh, dislocation storage uh, in the uh, microstructure and it's, it's worked very well. Um, and we can now, we, we, we usually follow the, uh, the deformation with the microstructure that the austenite generally deforms first, yes, and then uh, as you have introduced enough deformation in the uh, austenite, you will have strain-induced transformation to martensite. Yeah. The nice thing about this is that instead of having these very flat uh, stress-strain curves, we now have smooth stress-strain curves. And this here, this uh, parabola, yes, is the strain hardening curve that you get when you multiply the stress strain, uh, the, excuse me, the strain hardening times the stress and you plot this versus the, the true stress, if you have a parabolic uh, function that comes out, that tells you this material will be, have a perfect uh, press forming behavior. Hmm? Again, nice to have a little uh, uh, constitutive model for materials like this because it allows you to, once you have that model, to switch on, switch off processes, change the stability, of the austenite, see what that does, and uh, change the composition of your steel, and see what this does to your stress strain curve. So this, this is an example here of a 
experiments and model and, and the uh, strain hardening curve that we get in the case of this uh, medium manganese steel. Now, so that's a solution that works. Um, we asked ourselves, uh, is it possible to have uh, some of these steels that will give us twip behavior rather than a trip behavior? And if so, um, uh, how can we do this? So the, the idea is instead of having a more expansive uh, twip steel where that's fully austenitic, let's have, let's reduce the manganese content uh, to, for instance, 10%, yes? And uh, where you can't make twip steel anymore, it's not possibly, yeah? Um, but you intercritically anneal it, yes? And again, you let carbon and manganese and aluminum partition so that the aluminum, excuse me, the, uh, the uh, manganese and carbon content in the uh, gamma phase, intercritical gamma phase, are high enough to get the same stacking fault energy as in a twip steel. Then the idea is that when you deform this microstructure, the gamma phase will have a twip effect rather than a trip effect. And what are the properties then? Hmm? Uh, so before I go this, let's, let's, I just want to show you, if you take a 12 or a 10% manganese steel, yes, and it, you treat it like a twip steel and you do, you process it as if it were an austenitic steel, you do all the uh, annealing in the homogeneous austenite phase, you get very poor, uh, high straight rate of strain hardening, but very poor properties. You know, elongated are not worth the money uh, you spend alloying it with 10 or 12% uh, of, of manganese. However, you do an intercritical annealing, and you see you can achieve 1,000 megapascal, 60% of elongation, so very nice. Right? And um, in the process of doing this, uh, Sangwon, which is the student who uh, worked on this system, found out that uh, you look at the work hardening, it has two peaks. It has one peak and another peak. The first peak we expected, of course, because it is due to the twinning of the, the gamma phase. Yes, and you can see here, you get uh, at low strains, you get uh, twins and stacking falls in the microstructure. And if you strain more, there are more twins. But the second one is, is due to a trip effect. So it turns out that this very high elongations that we can get and uh, high stresses yes, are actually due to subsequent uh, twinning, twipping, and after that, formation of uh, trip, uh, by uh, formation of martensite and the trip effect in the one after the other. And we see this twinning first, this is a twinning kinetics, this is a uh, martensite uh, formation kinetics. Again, I'm going back here a few slides. The, the reason why it works is because you uh, intercritically anneal the material and you have a mixture of two phases. Yes? In this case, um, uh, you, you have, uh, this is a typical uh, microstructure where you get these nice uh, properties. And, and you need to have a nice uh, uh, broad uh, alpha plus uh, gamma intercritical uh, uh, range to, to achieve this. All right. So, yeah. Um, the properties, uh, it's, it's nice uh, w uh, now when I conclude to uh, have a look at uh, how they compare with industry standards today. Uh, today, a, a good standard material of a high strength material is what we call a first uh, generation advanced high strength steel, is our uh, DP steels, DP 780 and DP. 980. These are very important materials today in, in uh, automotive uh, construction. Yes. And uh, overlaid on this, you see the stress strain curve of some of these intermediate or and, and medium uh, manganese steels. And you can see we have uh, properties that are, um, yes, uh, definitely less than a 100% uh, manganese uh, austenitic uh, steel, but nevertheless uh, very much better than um, the current industry standards. In addition, the um, industrialization of this solution of uh, having multi-phase 
medium to intermediate manganese steels is interesting, um, it's easier. It's easier in, so you can basically run this, these materials without much change in a uh, hot strip mill. Yes, again, um, there, will, there may be potentially problems when you have a two-phase uh, manganese steels which, which contain uh, a certain volume fraction of delta ferrite, so you, don't, you will not be rolling 100% of, of uh, austenite in uh, the hot strip mill, so that's one thing you have to look uh, out for as a potential problem. Um, of course, you have to turn the material into martensite at the end of the rolling, yes? That is not, in principle, a big problem. However, the coilers you have here must be strong enough to do the coiling, right? Uh, so that means that the carbon levels uh, in this particular solution have to be controlled to low levels, hmm? uh, meaning less than 0.1%. Again, uh, conventional uh, cold rolling shouldn't be a problem and uh, shouldn't be the uh, annealing process. You know? So the cold rolling, again, if you use the route of uh, uh, martensite route, you will need to reverse martensite route. You'll need to have a very low carbon martensite. Otherwise, uh, the, the, you'll have mechanical difficulties. The intercritical annealing is not a problem, uh, certainly not with these aluminum additions. I've, sh I've shown to you that the, the, the best conditions for the annealing are very close to what is industrially used, and then the cooling is uh, not very critical in terms of cooling rates. So, in conclusion, I started by saying uh, that the research in uh, manganese steel seemed to be, from afar, very diffuse, Maybe confused, but that once you look into it, you can see that we're all involved in a big effort to um, to engineer the strain hardening. Yes, and um, you you have to realize that the uh, this kind of effort uh, has hasn't been done before. This is really a new trend in in, in steel research, where people uh, because strain hardening is such a difficult thing to control. Mm -hmm. About uh, 30 years ago, the steel industry was really involved in a major uh, activity in controlling the texture of steels, yes? And as, uh, as a result, has, has done, improved the products vastly, yes? Nowadays, uh, you have to see the, uh, the research effort on the high manganese steels, on the lower manganese steels, in, uh, in the framework of strain hardening engineering. And I've shown you that there are many of the concepts, the concepts we at MDL work on and concepts that other people on campus, on this campus, or in the industry work on, um, uh, are actively being investigated. And all of them actually have a good potential, a good chance as being third generation auto body steel uh, in the future. One important thing, a message also I hope uh, through, is that any uh, concept, any concept uh, that will be successful be, will be the one that's compatible with current industry limitations and requirements. Mm -hmm. And that is not at the steel, uh, steel industry only, but also in the uh, automotive industry. So I've come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Uh, thank you for your long and excellent lecture mm -hmm. and uh